Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jen Elder. I'm the director of the SAMHSA Homeless and Housing Resource Center, and we are excited uh, to welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, next slide on street medicine for unsheltered individuals serving people where they are. Um, next slide. I have a few housekeeping items to cover. The first is a disclaimer. We are supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, but the contents of this presentation are the authors and don't necessarily represent the official views of or an endorsement um, of or by SAMHSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. Next slide. So as we get started today, um, as you hopefully can see in your video, we are joined by Tabitha and Katie, who will be uh, providing American Sign Language interpretation. If you need to, you can use the, the panels in Zoom to pin their videos. We also have live transcription um, available. If you click the, the closed captioning button and select show subtitle, that should come up for you. If you're having any technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to contact us at our email address. That's the fastest way to, to get in contact with somebody here. Next slide. So all participant lines will be muted. That question's come in um, a few times already. We're gonna be using the Q&A feature to gather your questions during the webinar today. Um, there's so uh, quite a few people joining the room have already come in. And so everybody's line is gonna be muted just to um, reduce any of that background noise. We will have a recording available on the HHRC website, typically about between a week and a week and a half from now. And so if you want to see this webinar again or um, share it with a colleague, that would be great. Uh, the webinar documents are available right now. So if you want to open up the slides and follow along, that's available at our website, hhrctraining.org. Following the uh, webinar, we will uh, make sure that you are directed to the link for our evaluation. That'll be in the follow-up email that you receive from Zoom as well. And uh, we appreciate your time uh, filling out that evaluation. And at the end, you'll receive a certificate of participation following the survey, though no CEUs are provided um, from HHRC. Next slide. So today we're going to, um, we're joined by a really great uh, panelist of presenters. We're gonna describe uh, the core values of street medicine, um, explain person-centered practices, and, and really talk about the, the value that it's, it brings to increasing the, the health um, of individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And so really excited to get you to, um, to meet the panelists today. So we joined first um, by Brett Feldman. Um, he uh, is the director and co-founder of Street Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine and has practiced homeless medicine since 2007. Brett also serves as the vice chair of the Street Medicine Institute. Um, Dr. Aislin Bird, or sorry, Aislin Bird, uh, is a psychiatrist with the Alameda, Alameda County Healthcare for the Homeless Program. And she founded Street Health, um, which is a backpack medicine team providing low barrier psychiatric and substance use disorder treatment um, for those experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Wilma Lozada will also be joining our panel today. And Wilma is a community health outreach worker and social worker with the Alameda County Healthcare for the Homeless program. She has worked for Alameda County for 21 years and has extensive experience in housing navigation and uh, engagement with individuals. Then also we are joined by Lawrence Lincoln, who is uh, formerly homeless and gratefully housed and has been a former street medicine patient of the Alameda County Healthcare for the Homeless um, Outreach Program. Uh, Lawrence has been volunteering uh, his time down with the downtown street team to help others um, who are experiencing housing insecurity. So we are excited to uh, to have all of those presenters join us. I will say their full bios are available on our website in the documents. I encourage you uh, to check that out. Next slide. So we are going to get started with a quick poll question just to take the temperature of the attendees today about your experience with street medicine. So you should see that coming up on your screen. How familiar are you with street medicine? For some, it might be the first time hearing about it. 
somewhat familiar with the basics, maybe you have experience as part of a street medicine team, or maybe you're very familiar in practicing street medicine. So you've uh, been part of that team, you are um, have a lot of familiarity with this. So we will take just a few seconds for uh, everybody to, to get their votes in. We have just about 71% of the votes in, which is, which is fantastic participation. Thank you. How about five more seconds? We'll do a five, four, three, two, one, last few votes and end the poll. Share the results that should come up for everybody. Um, so this is a really great uh, mix of experience. And so for 44% of you, it's your first time hearing about street medicine. That's fantastic, welcome. Um, and others are somewhat familiar with the basics. So I think there's a lot um, that's really helpful for our presenters today, a lot to, um, uh, to go from, make sure I'm Stopping sharing the results. All right. Well, with that, I think we will launch right into the presentation. I will hand it over to Brett to get us started. Hi, thank you very much. Just get my presentation loaded. All right, so as Jen said, my name is Brett. I'm the Director of Street Medicine for USC and Vice Chair of the International Street Medicine Institute. For those of you not familiar with the Institute, it provides technical assistance to about 140 programs around the world, about 90 of which are in the United States. Um, and I'm gonna hear, uh, today I'm just gonna talk about some of the basics of what street medicine is, why it's important, um, and more important than what we're doing are some of the you know, founding principles and philosophy that guide everything that we do. So the whole idea of street medicine is that people experiencing unsheltered homelessness just can't access healthcare the way the rest of us do because of their um, understandable preoccupation with basic needs of survival, like where their next meal is coming from, where they're gonna sleep tonight, if they're gonna be safe doing those things then it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to access healthcare in a brick and mortar facility. So in response, we uh, leave the comfort of our offices and go to them in a very assertive way with the goal of first delivering a tender love. And then after that, the same quality healthcare on the street that you would expect in a brick and mortar clinic. Um, this is uh, a, a part of some of our team, but it just gives you a basic understanding of who's out there. Um, we I'm a physician assistant, and we do have a physician supervisor who comes out with us. Um, we also have a nurse and then a community health worker. This is a little bit different of a role for, the, for a community health worker. Um, this is somebody ideally with lived expertise in homelessness um, who just knows the streets better than anybody. Um, the gentleman on the far left, his name is Joseph, and he's the community health worker in this picture and is um, very open with with his background, so I'm not gonna share anything with you that he doesn't share publicly often, but um, he had been homeless since he was nine years old and grew up literally on Skid Row um, and didn't find stable housing into his mid twenties, um, which was largely gotten um, from uh, dealing drugs. He then spent some time in prison where he found Jesus and uh, has been working for us for, for a few years, um, but had some wonderful experience prior to ever coming to us. Uh, we also do some very high level wound care. Um, this is a gentleman who had a um, wound from, um, from in, injecting drugs that was recommended that he use a uh, vac to close the wound. For those of you not familiar with what a vac is, is, is it kind of is what it seems like. It means the wound was deep enough. This one was about the size of a tennis ball um, that it, it requires packing and then attachment of a vacuum to kind of squeeze the ends together uh, to help it close. And he would have had to have gone to a nursing home for this and he was not interested 
in doing that, so he came out to the streets and we were in charge of changing his dressings outside. Um, so this is Corinne, one of our other PAs working on his dressing changes. Um, but we know that, that uh, healthcare is more than just an office visit or some wound care. So we dispense medications, draw labs. This is uh, Dr. Olson doing a, an ultrasound on our truck bed um, in the street. But like I said, more important than, than what we're doing is are these values and philosophy that guide our care. So we believe care should be patient-led. I know you've all heard of patient-centered care, and in my deranged mind, what has happened to patient-centered care is I just I envisioned this patient um, in this hole, and we've just built up this system so high around them that we can't even find them in it anymore. Um, so we believe that, that the care should really be guided um, by the patient and led by the patient. We believe in reality-based medicine. So you know you've all have heard of evidence-based medicine and the evidence is a great place to start, but life is not a double-blind randomized controlled study. So we start with the evidence, but then we have to apply it to the reality of the street. And you don't know the reality of the street unless you've been on the street to witness it. So we really want when we go out to suspend our reality and meet the people in their reality where they feel most comfortable. We believe in unconditional respect for our patients um, one of our uh, friends that does street medicine in Southampton, England, Nick McGuire, coined this term, one less FU. And what this means is that you go out to the patient, they're FU, FU 20 times and chase you away. And then the next time, FU, FU, and it's 19 times. And that's a success. No matter how many times you're FU'd away, you have unconditional respect for them as people. We see medicine as an instrument of peace. Uh, we won't have time to go into it today, but um, there is a, a lot of evidence that part of the reason why folks don't access brick and mortar care is because of previous trauma and previous negative experiences with the healthcare system. So as much as we would like to believe that it's just this general dislike of structure or organizations, this is actually something that we've earned. So us coming to them um, is, is a gesture of peace both for us and our colleagues. And lastly, we see medicine as a tool of advocacy. When we're given the privilege to walk this journey with our friends um, experiencing unsheltered homelessness, we see things that we can't unsee. And in doing so, we become witnesses. And as witnesses, we have a duty to go back to people who have not been under that bridge with us and report to them what we've seen. Um, so there are times, especially before COVID and now starting to, to come again that I will be under a bridge and then within an hour be in a boardroom explaining to them what I just saw and how that should influence policy. But if there was one thing that I think is really the key to street medicine, it's this. It's this uh, approach with radical humility. So you can see that uh, the patient has been given the position of authority. He's leading us and we're all bent down in a servant's position. Our heads are equal. Um, in this picture, you can't tell who's a student, who's a PA, who's a physician, who's the CEO of the um, of LACUSC, which is the biggest county hospital in Los Angeles, who's in this picture. But you can tell that the patient has been given the position of authority um, where the authority belongs. And street medicine is practiced very differently um, in a lot of different places. As I mentioned, with the Institute, there's about 90 um, members uh, across the country, and we practice differently, whether it's on the streets of Skid Row, where there's 2,500 folks within a few blocks, um, or in the woods, where we're really teaching them um, how to camp safely. So in this area, we might be educating our patients on um, how to drink the uh, water in the, in the creek properly, how to prevent um, the bears or the coyotes from getting into their tents and getting their food versus on Skid Row, it's the rats. So some uh, basic principles about how to actually build the model strategically and, and some of the more technical aspects is, is a foundational standpoint is you let the streets build the program. Uh, the second I start to build it, it's going to be a huge embarrassing failure. So the first few months, just to give an example, in LA, I didn't even think about seeing any patients. I, I uh, was on the street and tried to interview at least 100 people in each service planning area, which amounted to about 800 interviews. 
of folks who are sleeping outside about what they thought they needed, who they thought who was coming out to them, who they thought was helpful, who was not as helpful, which was good to decide who are our uh, community partners were going to be. And, um, and that definitely changed some of our initial thoughts on how the program should be developed. Uh, we also have to develop a street strategy. Um, in LA, there was 45,000 unsheltered homeless. I was the only provider. So who was going to be first? How we, were we going to decide that? Um, and a strategy, a street strategy, is not just a menu of services. Um, I speak with a lot of organizations and I, and I ask them what their street strategy is and the response is, is everything that they do. Um, then you have to determine your scope of practice. When I first started street medicine, the um, prevailing outreach model was this engage, refer, treat model where you send anybody but medical folks onto the street to build relationships and then refer them into the clinic in order to start treatment. No treatment is actually delivered on the street. In street medicine, we kind of jokingly call this the go fetch model um, because it's, it, it, uh, if it works, it works in a very limited capacity. Um, I also wanted to make sure we talked about the difference between mobile medicine and street medicine um, or, or RV medicine. So street medicine is delivered to people experiencing unsheltered homeless in their own environment. Um, I talked about suspending our reality and meeting them in theirs. And, um, and once we take them out of their reality into our space, we have then also taken um, the, the um, advantage and we want them to be comfortable even if it's in a space when we're not comfortable. So even if it's a mobile RV that we've driven close to them, but we've taken them onto it, that's now our space. Probably even licensed it. Um, and then a part of scope of practice is if you're delivering episodic or primary care, this could change. You might want to do primary care. You might want to do ongoing diabetes, hypertension management, but you're only out a few times a month and uh, know that you can't do that yet, but maybe that's a goal in the future. You also need a good QA and QI plan, quality assurance and quality improvement plan. So just because we're on the street and outside doesn't mean that the people we're serving deserve any less of uh, quality of care. Our QA, QI plan looks slightly different than a traditional one because it has to reflect the things that are important to the people we're serving. Um, and then lastly, we have to fight a retreat from the street. So what I mean by this is uh, you, you get out there, you're doing great work, and then outside influences start to get on you, whether it be, um, usually they're related to billing or some sort of revenue uh, stream, where it's like, you know, we, we've been going to see those guys, but if we just park ourselves at this shower event, we'll be able to see that many more people. Um, but to get to that shower event, you had to leave the camp, you had to be willing to engage, and before you know it, you're seeing only the the most highly functional people experiencing homelessness and you've lost sight of, the, of those who are most in need. Um, or you don't go out to the street at all and you start working in the shelters um, because that's where you can see the most patients. And then before you know it, you're looking at each other saying, didn't we used to do street medicine? And lastly, fall in love with the work and fall in love with the people that you're serving because this is very hard and um, that love is going to be the only thing that I know of for sure that will keep you engaged in it. So this is how our, our uh, program is, is built. Our vision is that all unsheltered homeless have access to basic health care. Um, after all those interviews, you actually started with a hospital-based consult service where we um, use a hospital admission as a proxy for medical necessity, thinking if they were admitted for something, they will need follow-up for something. And that was our way of identifying the people who were most in need of our limited services. Um, we also have a street-based care, uh, workforce development and, and education curriculum. Um, and then finally, uh, research, because there it really is not very much research on street medicine. We've all that who have done this have had to either fight to exist or fight to survive. And if there was good research, maybe we wouldn't have to fight as hard. Um, just a word about the workforce development and, and education. This is kind of split in further. The workforce development is for existing clinicians who are interested in starting a program or, or enhancing the type of care that they're doing. These are just some of the results I wanted to share with you. 
on the left is life without street medicine and on the right is life with street medicine um, on the impact on hospital readmissions. Um, there was two, there was one study that, that looked at this with a 50% readmission rate at LAC USC hospital before we got there, it was 30% readmission rate. And then on the right, where I previously worked at Lehigh Valley Health Network, I was able to get it down to 11% and at LAC USC right now it's 74% readmission rate. So we're starting to see if this is a replicable model. Um, we didn't decrease readmissions by increasing the length of stay. That was um, down 40%. And we're focusing on the proper discharge, um, not just any discharge or, or an expedited discharge. Actually, 30% of our folks get discharged into some sort of housing. But one of the things I'm most uh, proud of is our, our firm establishment in primary care. So relying on the brick and mortar clinic, there's a local HCH um, and their no-show rate of referrals from the hospital is 90%. Um, in the DHS, Department of Health Service for all of LA County, if they are impaneled to DHS, only 27% have ever seen their PCP. But when entrusted with our team, uh, we're able to consistently follow 73%. So one of the last things I wanted to help us think about is, is how we're defining access to care. And too often in healthcare, we think of access as a geographic proximity or appointment time slots. Um, and for those of you who are, who are in the LA area, you might recognize this. This is the homeless help desk on the left is actually City Hall. Um, right now, this is just completely covered with tents, but it wasn't at this time. Um, and I thought this was a very ironic uh, moment because here's the homeless help desk. You can't see it, but it says no wrong door in that building. And then here's somebody experiencing homelessness in the foreground. So I roused them and was like, hey, it looks like you're experiencing homelessness. Have you ever been to the homeless help desk? And he had some not nice words to say about the homeless help desk, but he did share that he had never been there. And with our typical criteria, it's not a geographic issue. It's right there. I've never seen anybody in the homeless help desk, let alone a line out the door. So it's not an appointment time slot issue. So what is it? Um, and I think that's the key for all of us when we're trying to answer that in our communities. The World Health Organization has six pillars of quality assurance. One is access, but another one is acceptable. So it's probably that acceptable thing that is not um, being met with, with this homeless help desk. But finally, more than any of the medications we're delivering or wounds we're, we're trying to work on, um, it's our willingness to, to share in the suffering of the patients that we're serving um, and, and really just love them and reassure them that we know that they're out there, that we care that they're out there, and we're going to keep coming back um, no, matter, no matter what happens to them. Great, thank you so much, Brett. That was fantastic information. We've had some great questions coming in, so keep those questions rolling. We also had a wonderful comment uh, saying, love the love, excellent recommendation. And I just uh, wholeheartedly, 100% um, support that as well. So now we're gonna turn to uh, our other presentations by Dr. Island Bird, Lawrence Lincoln, and Wilma Lozada. Great, take it away. Hi, thank you everyone. It's an honor to be here. and I'm excited to talk about our street health team. Next slide. So before um, I talk about street health and before you um, think about developing a program for folks experiencing homelessness, it's so important to know what homelessness looks like in your community because it looks different everywhere. And one of the ways that you can understand what homelessness looks like is by looking at the point in time count data. So Alameda County, which is located in the um, California Bay Area, last did a point in time count in January 2019. And on this one night, we counted over 8,000 people experiencing homelessness. Now of note, out of these 8,000 people, almost 80% were unsheltered. And this is a huge percentage of unsheltered people 
compared to other counties in the country. We also see that there was a high rate of folks with self-reported behavioral health and substance use disorders. Next slide. So at Healthcare for the Homeless, we recognize the unique needs for people um, experiencing homelessness and especially the unsheltered or unsheltered neighbors. And so to address their unique needs, um, we agree with Brett and his team that we should bring those services directly to where um, our most vulnerable neighbors live. So in 2015, we started um, working with two of our contractors to provide street medicine services. And during this time, we also recognized uh, the great unmet behavioral health needs that this community has. So in 2017, we were able to start our own um, street health psychiatry team that served folks living in Oakland with a real focus on providing in-depth uh, behavioral health care to folks on the street. But again, we qu quickly realized that the need was great. Alameda County is a large county. We really wanted to provide um, more in-depth services to the whole county. So in 2019, we were able to expand our few teams to 14 teams that covered all of Alameda County. And each team has a true multidisciplinary um, team and is able to provide um, in-depth services to um, the people we care for. Next slide. So a way that we um, organized these 14 teams was again looking at the point in time data. So we divided up Alameda County into 14 zones. And with, within each zone, there's roughly 500 unsheltered individual. And each team was assigned to one zone. And these teams really become experts of, of their zone. They know what homelessness looks like um, in their location. And they know all of the resources that are available to their clients. Um, and homeless outreach looks really different depending on where you're working. So you're doing outreach in downtown Oakland, which is very urban, very dense homeless encampments, looks very different than doing outreach in East County, where it's very rural. And it's very likely that you're walking for a good 20 minutes upriver before you come to a small encampment. We also have three um, coordinator uh, county leads, and they work with a small subset of each of the teams and work closely with county and city leads and our community partners, kind of that higher level um, care coordination. Next slide. So our team members, we have a nurse care manager who is our team lead. And they're really the heart of our team. They do all of our patient panel management. They know where all of our clients live, what they need. They refer our clients to our providers. They help with follow-up um, and all this on top of doing their regular nursing and enabling services. And the nurses primarily works out in the field. Our community health outreach worker works closely with the nurse, again, mostly in the field and they help complete our outreach assessment um, so we understand what our clients need and have a big focus on doing housing problem solving and housing applications, as well as referrals. And whenever we refer a client to another um, program or team, we really walk um, with our patient through that process to make sure that that linkage actually happens. We also have a social worker who provides intensive case management services to a small portion of our of the our patient population. We have a medical provider who provides um, the same high quality of care that they provide in the clinic, but out on the street. So this is you know a regular assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. And we have a psychiatrist um, who again provides the same quality of service um, in the clinic out on the streets. Next slide. So some of our core components, we really strongly believe that it's important to develop and maintain a consistent site schedule. And this helps build trust and rapport when our patients know that we are going to be at their encampments at a certain time every week. 
we want we want to be um, we want our patients to be able to rely on us, and having that consistent schedule really helps. It also helps with just general outreach and engagement. Um, we found that having short, frequent contact over a period of time can really help build that trust because we can't provide any of our services unless we have that trust with our clients. We also believe that collaboration and partnership is key. We can't do this alone. We need to have a strong team. So um, breaking down those silos and barriers and partnering um, is absolutely critical. And we're also data-driven. So we really look at um, our data to see, are we actually doing what we say that we are doing and help to um, change our model and our services to best provide the care to our clients. Next slide. So some of our services, again, just outreach, engagement, building trust, um, and tending to folks' basic needs. In terms of um, medical services, um, we provide you know, basic primary care, behavioral health, with a focus on treating substance use disorders, um, and especially opioid use disorder. And we can um, just, um, prescribe buprenorphine directly on the street. And we can also administer long-acting injectable medications in the field as well as needed. Um, we have a big focus on health education. And our ultimate goal is to connect our clients to a brick and mortar clinic. But we also recognize that going to a clinic might not be a good fit for um, our patients at any time. And then we will always provide them with care on the street. Housing is key. We believe that housing is healthcare and everyone deserves housing. So our, all of our case management um, is focused on housing, housing problem solving, um, and completing housing applications. Next slide. Of course, COVID-19 has impacted us all. And because we had such close relationships with counties, city partners, our community partners, we were able to employ very quickly an in-depth COVID-19 response to our um, unhoused neighbors. So this includes doing um, homeless outreach rapid response and doing environmental scans, um, contact tracing. If someone did need to be in quarantine, we worked with our isolation and quarantine hotel through Project Room Key to get people housed but also recognizing that not everyone wanted to go into the hotel system. So we help support them being um, in isolation or sheltering in place wherever they were on the tent and on the street in their car. We work closely with public health to do ample testing and testing wherever our clients were um, in the street shelters or in the hotel. And we also continue to provide vaccines. Um, this is really low barrier access to vaccines. Again, meeting our patients wherever they are. We also support vaccine choice, knowing that not all of our clients um, want to receive the vaccine. But since um, early March, we were able to provide um, almost 5,000 vaccine doses. Education is also a really um, important component to this, and we've led many trainings and webinars for outreach providers and shelter providers. And with that, we're gonna move on to some of our lessons learned, especially in regards to outreach assessments and housing navigation. And I'll pass it on over to Wilma. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Wilma, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know what's up with my video, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Uh, thank you so much for having us. This is like a real treat. It's always wonderful to share our experiences with other people. Um, I wanna be able to start, um, first of all, I, as the outreach worker, I'm actually the first person that usually makes contact at our camps. And always walking in with respect and humility. Hi, this is Wilma with Healthcare for the Homeless. Is anyone home? 
because I've been further that's your home and I respect. And if you say, I don't want to talk to you right now, I always offer to say, we'll be back next week. Is it okay if I come by and say hi then? So always walking in with just that kind of uh, presence to let people know that we're not threatening, we're not here to do anything, but to serve whatever you need. And then with that, I have to say that um, one of the things that I find most important is outreach assessments or assessments as a whole. Okay, I know it's paperwork and we all don't necessarily love to do paperwork. However, um, assessments get us information. We need to ensure that when we're administering these assessments that we are mindful of the questions, which means that we need to understand and know who our, our clients are, age, language, sexual orientation. So we need to really try to understand what we're dealing with when we are applying these um, assessments. Uh, for me, the assessment, I've done it so much that it's memorized. So basically, I can have a conversation with the client and be completing the assessment. So I don't have to have a clipboard in my hand checking things off. I can do that when I get back to the office because I, I can remember um, the conversations that we've had. And so I am paying attention to the client as they're talking to me. I'm always mindful of the surroundings, make sure that there's privacy. And sometimes I can't finish the assessment in one visit. Sometimes it's just not possible and that's okay. I'll finish it at the next time. Always asking for permission. Is it okay if we finish this next time I see you? When will be a better time for me to meet with you to finish this? Assessments help us gather information, the history of the client, including housing, treatment, incarceration, uh, what has worked in the past. And you know, most important is what are your priorities? What can we work with together? Um, because this is a partnership. Um, very important that gathering the information will help us do our job better. So if a client is connected to, let's say, uh, uh, another program or a full service partnership, and they just happen to have disconnected for whatever reason, they moved to a different camp, their worker left, and they're interested in reconnecting with that agency again, then we become a bridge. So how about if I help you reconnect with that agency, your experience was good. And then if they want to then we do a warm handoff. We go with them to the agency and we try to reconnect them with the agency again. If they don't want to be part of that agency again, then, you know, we can ask why. Um, because what we want to make sure is that we do not do the same thing that agency did that alienated that person from the agency. Um, so it's really important that we just kind of have that dialogue with the client and accept whatever they say. If they want to go back, yeah, I'll help you get back. But if they don't want to, it's okay. Part of the information we're gathering is have you ever been to a substance use program? Um, if yes, how did it go? Did, how did it go for you? Did you get what you wanted out of it? It's just trying to get more information. And then once we have this information, then as the worker, we can sort of formulate what resources we're going to acquire to help this person with their identified goals. It's always their identified goals. And I always tell this to the clients. The only time you're going to do what I tell you is if you're bleeding profusely or you're telling me you're having a heart attack. Then you got to do what my nurse tells you to do. But otherwise, you drive this bus and we work together to figure out what it is that you need and how we can um, get you your needs met um, in a way that you want that to happen. I always will go to the, with the clients, I always go to the appointments. Um, I'm always with them on the phone calls. I always say, can you handle it? If you can handle it, it's yours, but I'll be right there if you get stuck. I have gone with clients to social services to apply for benefits and literally have spent the whole day with them there and recognized that this was another traumatic experience. So we worked with social services and because we're county, it's easy to do. And, and then what we de developed was um, the process where a person, a social worker from social services can actually come to our office and do the intake for GA benefits, uh, Medi-Cal benefits, and whatever. They no longer have to go to social services and sit, and sit there for you know, five or six hours. So we made that change to accommodate clients and, and help make them feel more comfortable. Sometimes they don't wanna take a shower, sometimes whatever, but they can come into our office and meet the worker there. And that to us, that was a really big, that's a really, really big plus. Um, you know, when we also do assessments, we also find out who, the client's um, support systems are. 
maybe they have a dad that, that talks to them, that's their payee or a sister, or maybe they have a friend, all that kind of stuff is important to know because then as we build a service around them, we can also bring those individuals if the client wants and when the client wants to also be of support because uh, county employees cannot work on the weekends and stuff happens on the weekends. So we wanna make sure that there's a net, not to cover the person, but to hold the person. The net is always at the bottom, is to make sure to catch whatever and then help the person to um, move forward. Um, releases of information are absolutely key. So if, individ if an individual tells you that they've been through this program, that program, that program, you can ask permission to say, if you wanted me to contact the program, I need to have a release of information, and this will be the information that I'll be requesting if that's okay with you. Even if you don't use that release of information at that moment, if the client gives you permission and signs a release of information, take it and put it away because you don't know if later on you're gonna need this, and then you already have the release of information um, with you. Um, housing navigation. Um, healthcare for the homeless is not a housing program, but we do assist individuals into accessing things like the community cabins um, or the home base, which is the, um, the FEMA trailers. So we have access to some services. We also have a small budget to put people in what we call our respite program, which is an SRO that we can put people there for a few days. Um, so we can do that. However, um, with COVID-19, all of our jobs changed and I actually became a housing person. So I was housing people with the uh, um, project room key as well as comfort, which is isolation. And then, then got into the, um, our HMIS system and HMIS is the homeless, 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 homeless management information system which is, I think, a national um, database. So in Alameda County, it's going through a huge change right now, where before we used to do the coordinated entry application on everyone, which led us to have 12,000 people on the queue who will never be housed. The changes are now more concentrated to those individuals that meet the HUD definition and then are put on the queue and they can get housed as fast as six months. So being part of the COVID-19 housing then got me involved into that process also. So now I'm actually, it's a great resource to have and to be able to do for our clients. Um, let's see. It's really important that one, putting someone in an apartment or an SRO is not the end of their housing um, assistance. I think we need to really recognize and understand that most of our clients have lived outside for a really long time. And so putting them inside four walls and a door, what we're also doing is isolating them from their own community. Because, you know, when you're housing someone, you, you got to be really clear to say, okay, you can't be having people coming over to your house to use drugs. You can't do this. You can't do that. There's a lot of uh, restrictions when you move someone inside. So you tend to isolate them more. And then you're moving them into a building where there's a whole bunch of people that don't think like them or have, don't view the world like they do. And so the isolation becomes even more to the point where maybe they don't go out to, you know, um, canvas their area. Where is my, my laundromat? Where's my supermarket? Where is this and that? So we need to really understand that. And we still need to hold our clients' hands very closely. Um, I used to have 12 people on Shelter Plus Care. And when I first housed them, I used to see them twice a week, home visits twice a week. I would call everyone on Monday, what's your medical schedule, what's your psych schedule, what do you need to do today, and I will see you in a couple of hours. And as people began to become more independent, then I will see them less and less and less. If there was a problem, then I would increase my visits to their home just to make sure that they were going to be okay. And um, yeah, they, that was like two years ago, and I, I'm happy to say that they're still housed. I even taught somebody how to cook. This guy has spent like 20 years in prison and didn't know. All he needed, all he knew how to do was open cans, and I taught him how to bake a chicken and potatoes and all that kind of stuff, and it was, it was very exciting to see him move forward in that sort of direction. 
Um, it's also important that we help clients pay their bills. How do you do that? Where do you do that? We want them to be successful. So just putting them in an apartment and leaving them, not good enough, not good enough at all. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always very humbling every time that I go on the field. I have no expectations whatsoever. Um, I always make sure I have lipstick on because you still got to look good when you go to the encampments because you want to just say you are just as important to me as going into a party. I want to be here with you. This is where I am present with you and I'm going to listen to you. And if you're hungry, Nick, I'll go get us a sandwich and we can sit on the sidewalk and talk while we eat our sandwich. You are a person who needs help. Um, I never really see a homeless person. I just see an individual who's um, who needs help. And I think that once I cross that 60 threshold, seniors are really close to my heart. It, 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 I, I tend to be more, more aggressive to, to help individuals who are seniors because too many of them, and um, they just seem to, you know, they're very close to my heart. Um, thanks. And um, now what I want to do is introduce Lawrence. And Lawrence was one of our clients um, a long time ago. And he's very close to my heart too. Lawrence. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really more than delighted to be here um, with Dr. Bird and Wilma and, and Brett Freeman uh, talking about uh, street medicine, um, and were it not for the really important work that they do out there, um, I wouldn't be here. So um, in the world of people who live indoors, uh, they talk about location, 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 right? Uh, for those of us who are domicilely challenged, it's like trauma, trauma, trauma. Um, I, like many of the people who are out on the streets, um, you know, trauma got me out there. And the daily violence that attends homelessness and poverty um, compelled me to medicate myself and live in a constant state of uh, what amounts to a great deal uh, of traumatic stress. Um, I, I remember, <laughs> like, okay, so I lived in a in a hovel that I had made out of uh, wrestling mats, right? Was, uh, uh, and under the bar, elevator BART station in, in West Oakland. And I remember the day that I first met Wilma. Like, I just, like, at the time, uh, I, I have a very strong uh, prescription for my glasses. I had to wear two dollar store pairs of the strongest ones they had to be able to yeah, actually see. And I remember looking out and I see this nice lady, and she did have lipstick on, by the way. Uh, uh, coming down the road and say, hey, what's up? And we started talking and she was just, she spoke to me as a human to human. And if you ask anyone on the streets, what are the major things you need? And uh, one of them is socks. And the other one is to be spoken to uh, respectfully, like, a, like you're another human, not that you're uh, part of the homeless problem. So we talked and we got to know each other and I, I'm pretty sure she did her assessment just on the fly right there. And uh, she asked me what I needed. I said, well, glasses would be great. So within a month or so, uh, I'm sitting with her and I can see her pretty face and her, you know, and, and her well done lipstick. And uh, I had glasses and we had a connection. And through the outreach, I came to know uh, Dr. Bird and I came to know um, uh, the trust clinic. I think one of the important things to, to think about is like the connection between the you know, the, the, your primary care and the people coming out on the street, where bad health happens, the trauma of our situation happens where we are. And the institutions are, are, we're afraid of them, but we're not afraid of people. We love people. We love each other. And we, we, you know, we welcome connection and that connection and the trust built by, you know, the ethics that have been talked about here. Uh, that's key. That's what it's all about. I lived in India for many years and, uh, uh, you know, India doesn't have a conception of homelessness. They have various levels of trauma, and the people who are out in the world, you know, they, they there's there's people to care about them out in the world, 
And that's, you know, we've, we've changed the dynamic of the world here. And, you know, you cross that, you cross that divide of the freeway at 580, that's, you know, it's, we might as well be in Timbuktu. And so it's hard for us to get sometimes just even physically to a provider. But when the providers come to us, we're so impressed and we have a great deal of respect for them and they for us. And so, you know, but still, you know, it takes time. Things take time. Housing takes a really long time. Um, getting clear with how to do self-care takes a long time. I had re I immediately, I reason I could go take a shower at the clinic. While I was at the clinic, I connected with, you know, some great services, uh, like a really good doctor, Jay. I, I got a, a therapist, uh, Jenny. Um, and one of the team members, the nurse, uh, Jared, was key. And I just, he was a, he became a friend. And, and Wilma got me in touch with what became my godsend savior, Andrea, who is my social worker. We worked together, but I was still out there. I was still using. And so the turning point for me was at one point, I was like the fireman for my little community. And after putting out about 10 fires, because a lot of times the fire trucks won't come out there because they don't have this ethic that we have about street medicine. So they'll just let it burn. Then they'll come look for bodies. But I, so I put fires out. And one time there was a dog inside a trailer that caught fire and there was no water, there's nothing. So I went in and uh, I got the dog out, but I got burned really, really badly. And I ended up in the ICU. By the time I got to the ICU, that trauma was my, was my wake up moment, my epiphany. And, um, and when I was lying there, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I had already assembled a group of people around me who I trusted. And, you know, Andrea made a, a direct connection with me and helped me kind of deal with all the finance parts. And, and Dr. Bird was so important to me because before then I was medicating myself. I was taking drugs because I didn't want to feel what the world was like. And at this point, I didn't care because the world felt so bad. I, I, like, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a professional do it. And I'd already been in consultation with Dr. Bird and I wasn't able to take my meds because I kept losing them. <laughs> So, but at this point I said, okay, I can't lose them now. I'm in an ICU, I got, I got people bathing me. So I started to take the meds that were appropriate to conditions in my mental state that I didn't even know about. You know, I was so in a fog of war that, you know, I didn't know I was depressed. I thought I was hyperactive, but you know, I took the medications. I had a respite. And when I got out of there, my team was there, you know, I didn't, I still didn't have housing. So I was out on the street. And from that day on, I never used drugs again, because I, you know, it, to me, at that point, I had learned enough to know that self care is like, I would be rude. I've got like 10 incredible people behind me who, who love and care for me, for me to keep abusing myself would be rude. I mean, I, I can't explain it more than that. But it was, a, it was an ethics sort of thing. So I never used drugs again. I let Dr. Bird medicate me. I I fought tenaciously to get housing and because no one's going to get you housing, no one's going to, you know, but the thing is, and this is another thing, it's traumatic to leave your, you know, the environment that you have adapted to. I had to leave that because I had to not keep doing drugs. So I had support and in that, in that vulnerable time, um, I, you know, I, you know, people take, getting housing takes a really long time. I, I ended up getting housing. And now I sit in a in a place, you know, it's several floors up from from the basement of the hierarchy of needs, and I'm really thriving. And that thriving in itself is traumatic because I'm not used to it. You know, I'm not used to having a roof over my head, uh, and I have support to say it's okay. To take that take that brave step into into uh, freedom. So here I am with y'all. Uh, I've gone back to school. I'm, I'm taking creative writing at San Francisco State, which was my dream before I, I, I kind of strayed off a path. Uh, I'm working, I've worked with Downtown Street Team, which is a, a, a working uh, a experience program where we go out and clean up the neighborhoods and we kids are, you know, you know dealing with homelessness and crisis and, and then, you know, give them some work, you know, that work structure. Uh, I wrote an article at the beginning of um, the pandemic called uh, Sheltering in Place Without a Place for SF Weekly. Uh, I really recommend you read it. I think it's in my bio. Uh, I, I'm, I look better on paper than I do in reality. So, so I love it if you all could read that. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done a couple of these presentations. This one, I'm, I, 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 I almost cried when I listened to Brett. Uh, 
uh, speak because that's what it's about. That's what the future is about because we're all here together. It's like Black Lives Matter to everybody. You know, a homelessness matters to everybody. It's not just homelessness. We don't want to live in a world that hurts. We don't want to walk by people who are people and 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 have to shun our eyes. You know. So, um, and and the most important thing that happened to me, and I'll share with you, my mom's real old, and because I was out on the street, I couldn't be with her. And uh, now I can be with her, and I can, you know, give her the care and and love that I've learned through doing this. Uh, you know, so uh, she's got someone to, you know, behind her, like I had people behind me. And uh, you know, the major takeaways I think are we can heal this. This is this is simple. It's less expensive. I mean, everything is measured by monetary value. So much less expensive to do this than to like let the, let uh, let the um, emergency room deal with the health of people who are out on the street. It's like, there's, it's just, it's a no brainer. And if money speaks like this kind of work is not only economical, but it's, it's, it's socially viable for growing into a, a, a new world that we're growing into. And, you know, this, I'm looking at what happened. There's 914 of you, bless, bless all your hearts. And, every, and, and people had slides. I don't have slides. So I want to share my little slide with you. This is my slide to my COVID vaccination. During COVID, you know, everything shut down. I had, like, I, I joke with my mother. My mother's got ties and she's a social worker for 36 years. Like, my health care is better than hers because I get acupuncture. That's what we decided. So, so I have my COVID shot. I have a really firm connection with, with people who are dedicated to provide health. And I've learned how to self, self heal and, and do self care. So, I really thank you all for listening to my story, and um, I'll hand it over to to whatever we do next. If you got questions or whatever, thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was incredibly moving to hear, um, both from uh, Wilma to share your best practices from your years of expertise, and you know, as you mentioned. Just just talking to people and, and hearing their needs and hearing their stories and being there alongside them. Um, and Lawrence, thank you for sharing your story. I think that's one of the most impactful ways that we can hear about how we can all do our jobs better and just be better at interacting with people and, and helping them. And so I will say there is uh, so much love coming through on the Q and A. Um, so thank you to the, the, um, uh, audience, we will make sure all of this is passed along to all of our panelists. I um, am really enjoying reading all of the, the love that's being shared for um, the, the panelists. So right now, uh, we are going to have just a short uh, roundtable Q&A of a few questions that um, that we had prepared uh, beforehand. And then there's been a lot of great questions coming in in the Q&A, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. If we can't get to all of them, we're going to talk with our presenters afterwards, get some answers, and put an FAQ doc um, together on the website. So, um, so not to worry, you are all being heard in the Q&A, and we will uh, be as responsive as we can. Um, so if we could get the, the panelists back on camera here. So, great. Thanks. All right. Um, so one of the... These are um, for our audience, like these are going to theme around like what are the takeaways from this, from this presentation? Like what are some great things that you can take and put into practice today? Um, so first of all, I wanted to hear from the panel about tell us a time when you saw street medicine make an impact in somebody's life or health. Alameda, you guys can go first. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, definitely Lawrence's story was is really remarkable. Um, more recently in January, I met um, a young fellow who was struggling with opioid use disorder um, and really um, came up to our team and said that he really would like assistance with um, treating his substance use disorder. Um, even though he was still living on the street. Um, and so I was able to start him on buprenorphine, which is a treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, 
And since then, since January, um, he has not used any opioids. He um, has a job, he's reconnected with his sister and his father is in touch with his kids more with the ultimate goal of um, obtaining custody of his two young children. So he's still not housed, which again is critical. Um, everyone deserves housing. But in the meantime, um, he was um, able to treat his substance use disorder with the assistance of our team and then has really just thrived. Um, and I believe that this will get him closer to being housed, hopefully. So quick, a quick success story. Got one, or like I said, okay, so Jared is our, our nurse, our outreach nurse taught me how to do um, uh, 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 the thing where you, uh, uh, I thought now I feel like I'm spacing on the name of it, but if someone's ODing on uh, heroin, like you give them a, 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 that's not Suboxone, it's the other one, but and Narcan. I learned how to, Narcan, yeah, Narcan, and uh, uh, the Narcan as a jab works better than Narcan as an inhaler, but th there's been four times that I've had the, the occasion to administer it, and four times I saw someone go from definitely slipping away to definitely being alive, and it does happen on the weekends, and because, you know, there's no liability issue or whatever, like I learned how to do that, and we made sure that we had Narcan all over. I, like, I, I don't, I'm kind of traumatized by it, so that's why I forget the name. But um, we have needle disposals. We have, you know, we we become self empowered, and that's self empowered. And when I, like now, I'm I'm grounded in my recovery, so I can go back out there and like put put the bins out, take the needles out, and uh, that is good. You know, seeing my, my neighborhoods being clean and not getting moved on because we're being clean and we're having a rapport with the neighbors. That that that's a miracle for me. And I, I, I must say one other thing, and this is just, okay, so 8,000 people homeless out on the street in Alameda County. I know 100 of those people. In the last year, even through COVID or whatever, this, this is a statistical thing from my from street level. I know 10 people who died in the last year, none of them from COVID. Mostly, you know, violence and uh, addiction-related stuff, bloodborne viruses. Uh, no one died of COVID. And uh, I know five people, myself included, who got clean and got up off the street. And I know five others who are on their way and who are making the, making the thing. So that is like 10%, you know, like I don't think it's ever been equal. I've never known it to be equal. Like the people lost the, to, to the thing and the people who made it and are on their way out. So that's a miracle. Um, you can't top Lawrence, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I mean, one, so I'm not going to try, but, um, one thing that I think about is not necessarily how street medicine has impacted people, but how we've been impacted by the people we serve. Uh, you know, I've been very blessed to have a lot of great mentors in my life. And, and uh, I would say the majority of them have lived outside when I met them. Um, one that I think about a lot, uh, his name is Craig and Lawrence's story reminded me of him a little bit, but I, I met him in a consult service. Um, he had just turned 50 years old, which would have been when he needed his first colonoscopy, but he was admitted with abdominal pain and had metastatic colon cancer everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and in talking to him, he said that he did not want any treatment. Um, and we couldn't, and he had been living in this drainage pipe for about three years when we met him and none of us could bear to see him be discharged to the drainage pipe. So I made a deal with the inpatient hospice unit that he could come and go when he wanted and maintain his freedom. Um, even though he really didn't qualify for inpatient hospice. Usually that is someone that's expected to pass within a week and he had a few months. Um, so I walked in there, you know, victorious that I had made this deal for him. And he's like, I don't want to go. I was like, what do you mean you, you don't want to go? And he said, well, you said that most people in there are going to die within a week. So they need the bed more than I do. Um, so he wanted to go back out onto the street, back to the drainage pipe. Um, so he did, and we 
provided hospice care to him at the drainage pipe until he got too sick and then eventually did bring him into the hospice uh, where he eventually passed away. But the thing that stuck with me the most that in his suffering, he was able to recognize others suffering mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that was a lesson that, that I will never forget. Yeah, Jared and I came across a client and we had been talking to him for a long time and he wasn't receptive at all. But I think after three months of constantly going and meeting with him, he finally started, you know, to relax around us and talk to us. And then we find out that he has scabies. And um, in order to be able to, you know, help him, we needed to make sure he had a place to take a shower. And he had a lot of hair and a lot of beard. And, you know, I think to me, and, and I think about this, and my heart just, just fills with love that he agreed to let us help him. We put him in the car. We took him to the clinic. And at the clinic has, um, uh, we work with the trust clinic and the trust clinic has showers. So what we did is we took him to the clinic at seven o'clock in the morning. So it was just Jared and I and the client, no one else was there. And I need to see him sitting on a chair, you know, with um, half his shirt was off. He was just sitting there calmly letting Jared shave his beard and shave his head. And he was just so trusting and so willing I mean, just like a little kid just letting you do because he knew it was the right thing to do. And, you know, it just made me feel like, okay, we are definitely doing the right thing. And the way we're doing it is the right thing. We wait, we wait, we wait, we patient. And we wait until that person is ready. And then when that person is ready, we're not very aggressive. We can say, how do you want to do this? And the way that they want to do it, and then that's how we do it. And, you know, I mean, with this particular guy, we could not understand we couldn't understand his, his English. We couldn't understand it. And so we literally had to call Oakland PD to come and do a drive-by to talk to him so that we can get the information from them um, to be able to help him. And we got him, he got housed. He got an FSP program, which is a, a, a triage of, of providers. And we've not seen him again. So I always think of him sitting there so trusting that we were doing the right thing for him and not hurting him. And, and that is like the best lesson. You, you know, when somebody does that, that you are doing the right thing and, and you're doing it the right way, so. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, so another question, uh, which actually has come up a bit in the Q&A so far today, so perfectly timed is, what advice would you give to someone who practices street medicine or street outreach um, and another side of that coin is what skills or characteristics do you think are imp important for providers to have? So what, what's your advice to those current or future street medicine providers of the world? I mean, I cannot stress enough the, um, the formalizing of um, assessments. And if you don't have an assessment, an outreach assessment, I'm sure SAMHSA has plenty of them that you can look at and see what fits and what meets your needs. Um, Having an assessment done gives you the clarity of your next steps and also gives you the information that you need to do to be able to deal with this individual, right? At their level, at whatever they need. Obviously, you know, and, and I mean, part of our questions are, you know, can you, are, you, are you a good reader? Are you a good writer? So if the client says no, then I'm definitely not gonna give him an application to fill out. I'm not gonna send him somewhere by himself. Right? I'm going to go with him because in the assessment, he told me he had problems with that. So I am going to make sure to use that as my tool to be able to continue to move forward in whatever I do to help him. Um, and then, I mean, I've been with the county for a thousand years and being with the county for a thousand years and doing so many different things, I CPS, I work for the court system, I work for public health. I never saw the work that I did didn't have the lens of homelessness, right? But now that I work for Healthcare for the Homeless for the last seven years, that is my lens, which means that I need to be willing to go to social services with somebody who's dirty, no shoes, and be there and be an advocate. Now, I, I know myself, you will never be rude to my clients, never. I don't care what happens, you will never be rude or disrespectful. I got to remember that because, you know, I can go like this. So I also, you know, I have to remember that I also need to show the client how to behave when these situations arise. But, you know, at first it was hard and then it just became normal. 
I can go to McDonald's and buy somebody a meal and sit with them and eat. And I don't care who's looking. I don't care who's looking. I don't care whatever my attention, you are my focus. I'm here with you. And, and, and I think that that's, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to do that. And, you know, again, documentation, 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 in case you leave, somebody can pick it up. So good documentation is always a really, really good idea. And I, knowing your resources really well, knowing your resources really, really well to be able to make a phone call and say, hey, can you set me up with a cabin for this person? Um, and then finding out what the steps are and making sure that the client understands and then let's go do it together, right? The first time we always do everything together because I want to also teach you how to do it eventually so you can do it by yourself. Um, so I think having the willingness to do that and, um, you know, and not just be a numbers pusher you can't just go out there and meet the quota. That's not the way this works. You might spend one day with one person, the whole day, and you gotta be prepared to drop everything and spend that whole day with that person um, if you wanna see the results. And, and it might not work. I mean, I had this client, Ms. B. Oh my goodness, the first time I met her, she cussed me out. And it was Friday afternoon, I'm like, Ms. B, I'm gonna go get you something to eat and something for your dog. You are not going to do this, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the B word was all over the world. It, and she, anyway, I came back and I gave it to her. And then I placed her in the, at the, at the trailers. And I would go check on her and I knock on the door and she would just be cussing out. Where is me, Miss B? Where my, oh, honey, how are you? This and this and that, you know? And I, I knew her and I knew that's how she was. And I was never offended. And I never, you know, reciprocated in a negative way. I always made sure that she knew that she was respected and that's how she is. Ms. B got her wings last year, last month. So we were never able to place her in a permanent housing, but she was in a trailer by herself with her dogs and she had a good life for the last six months. And so I, I'm comforted with that, even though she never made it to permanent housing. But I never gave up on her. She never insulted me. And I know between every other B word, that was love. I can go next since you guys are muted. And it, Wilma, I would never be rude to your patients. I'm very scared of what <laughs> would happen to me. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my advice for new uh, clinicians, and I'll, and I'll take just the medical side of it, is um, before you go out, you should do kind of a, a self-examination of what your disposition of heart is. Why, why are you going out in the first place? And the first thing you need to do is really empty yourself of the pride that we were taught in medicine. We tend to walk into a room, we think we're the most educated people in the room, here I am, you know, this is my treatment plan. These are the guidelines, you know, all those kind of things. But instead of here I am, it's there you are. And you have to go out with radical humility or all the knowledge in the world is going to be useless. Okay. So that's the first thing. And then once you're prepared, then you go out onto the street. And as I um, talked about in the presentation to let the streets build the program. And there's a whole process that on like, from a more like technical aspect on how that's done and how you listen to the streets um, that that is somewhat learned and there, there's an art to it too. Um, and that's how you'll build the program. Um, but, and then the last thing I would say is really examining uh, what your motivations are also internally. Um, I found three things that really motivate us. One is uh, a, a driver for duty where we think, you know, we're medical professionals, the people out there are really sick. So my duty is to go out and serve them. Another one is for justice, the people out there have been wronged and I'm gonna go out and right that wrong. And then the last one is love, which is um, that the people out there are suffering and my job is to relieve their suffering. And I think that it's kind of a triangle and we can figure out which one we're most inclined to. I find the ones that are uh, more inclined to love tend to last a little bit longer. The other two, when taken to extreme tend to burn out. Yeah, I, I want people to understand that like working with our clients is like a puzzle piece. You know, a puzzle piece has four, four, four sections, right? And so you have to turn it this way and see if it fits, 
turn it that way and see if it fits. You got to keep turning the puzzle piece until it fits into the big puzzle. And that's what it's like to work with our clients is that you can't give up because something didn't work. You got to turn that puzzle piece and see if this is the way that it works. Turn it again because eventually that puzzle piece, that client will fit into something. We just have to continue to try and, and not give up. And, and if the client doesn't want to deal with it today, we need to say it's okay. Today is not a good day. No problem at all. We'll deal with it tomorrow and continue to put that puzzle piece where it belongs. Lawrence or Island, just wanted to check if you had any advice before we moved on. <laughs> yeah, I think just quickly what both what Brad and Wilma were saying of just being patient, kind, humble, and you, know, you can go out with the best plan for the day and everything can change. Um, and yeah, I think those are the main highlights. I would only add that um, uh, take care of you because, you know, you're modeling like happiness. I mean, you're modeling a world that we, you know, are trying to maybe, you know, you're a bridge to a place that we are afraid to go to. So when, um, when you're okay and you got to take care of yourself, because this is hard work. I mean, when we're out there, we're like, we're like in a war, you know, and we're like doing drugs and we're out of there. And when you guys come, you guys come from another world, Josh, and we understand that and we, you know, like, the people like Dr. Bird and Wilma and Andrea and Dr. J, I mean, I can name 10 people who came out and, and met me and looked at me and they were like, I, they were heroes to me. And because they were able to stick it and be there and be consistent, you know, I can imagine like there's a lot of health services that came out there and I like, couldn't keep track of them. And, but these, these guys, because they, they were there every week on Wednesday, totally consistent, and they were okay, and they were happy, even in the face of some hard stuff. It, you know, that, that's what made it, and I'm, I'm still, you know, able to be in contact with the people that came out there, and then, you know, so just, it's a long run, like you're running a long distance, thing. that's, you know, just take care of you, because, you know, in your eyes, looking at us, we see some hope, and, and we want you guys to be good, too. <laughs> Thanks. It's really powerful. So along that lines, um, kind of in the, the transformation, I think that you've taught, like the group has talked about humility and changing the way that, that you do things and engage with others. So how, how has the practice of street medicine and this work that you do, how is that, you know, um, change the way that you engage with others? How, are there things that you've learned along the way that is, just change the way you interact um, with individuals that you uh, are either just through street medicine or just in general in humanity. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, it's really important that my clients, we start up 50-50. We each have our responsibilities, 50-50. And as we move forward, then I have 40 and you have 60. You move forward and I have 30 and you have 70. Um, being able to just like really partner with, with this person and letting them know that how they feel and what they want is valuable and important to them and to me. And that slowly but surely, I am going to not disappear, but I'm going to give you more control of everything. I'm gonna be less part of it and you're gonna be more part of it. And eventually I'm going to just be like somebody you can call for advice, right? Let me, how do I do this? Or when should I do this? Or should I do this? That's my ultimate goal is for you to be able to just call me and say, hey, I'm doing really well, but how about this? Can I ask you this or that? Um, I'm always going to be here to help. If something happens, if you fall, we will be there to pick you up. Remember with that bottom net, not the top net, with the bottom net. And I think that I've learned that. And it just, it just you know, when you see someone um, like Lawrence take charge of his life, that that is the ultimate goal of street health. Thanks. Kind of piggybacking on what Brett was saying in terms of the medical model, it's um, really easy to be like, okay, this is, 
I know what's most important for us to treat first, you know, your behavioral health condition or your substance use disorder, but really coming from such a place of um, humility and looking at the whole person and what, what are their needs and what, what do they want to prioritize first and working on that with a team um, and not pushing my own agenda on, on the people I work with. I think it's taught me to um, not put as much emphasis on the end results of things as much as the process. Um, there's so much that we can't control and things go wrong. Um, and and it, you can't internalize it like I'm just terrible at everything that I do. Um, and so you, you value the process. Mama talked a lot about being patient, um, and you have to be patient, and and uh, redefining what you see as success along the way. I think what I've really learned is that the more narrow the gap between yourself and the moment you're in, the more joy and the more present. And it's, it's achieved by you know, thinking about others and compassion is a great healer. Because if, like I spoke a lot about trauma, like trauma was a pain in the ass while I was in it and it has resounding effects. But if we start to just accept ourselves and accept others, um, then we realize that trauma actually really, I mean, my, the trauma that got me clean was it had been bad trauma, I thought I was gonna die. And like imparting that to others, like, it's like I've been able to go out and help other people. I learned to help myself and I take care of myself and that I know that I can't pull anyone out of a hole because I'll just fall in. But I can be out of the hole and dance around and go, hey, it's nice out here and like maybe throw a rope or just be there for other people. And I think I got that got shown to me because, you know, I had to do it. And I always tell everybody, I'm a total like sycophantic cheerleader for, <laughs> for Alameda County Health Care for the Homies. But for real, they showed me a way to do it. And that was really important to me because if they did it, then I just undo it because I've done that before. And a lot of us, that's why we're out here. But just learning that it's okay to be in a moment and that like, I'm okay, you know, like I'm not as, as, I don't deserve to be treated bad. I mean, I'm nice to everybody else. So I might as well be nice to myself. And that's, I learned that from, from the team a lot. Thanks. So I will say as we start to wrap up, we only have about seven more minutes. We have received over a hundred questions and comments and kudos in the Q&A. Uh, we will make sure all of your kind words get to our panelists because um, I don't wanna be the only one sitting here just like loving this and uh, almost uh, you know being emotional about how much uh, in inspiration is being passed along today. So, um, but I will say, I think there is one question that we can kind of wrap up on that I think really fits the theme of what we've been talking about of the real, um, the, the radical humility, the, uh, the characteristics that are making a good street medicine team. But um, a couple of questions came in of like, how do you recruit? How do you find this? Would, would this certain profession be good for this? Or like, what would you say? Who can do street medicine? Um, how do you find help? Can students be a part of it? What are your thoughts about who makes a good street outreach, uh, street medicine team member? Um, I, can, I can start with that if that's okay, because it's, it's a big, big challenge. Um, I would say first to join the Street Medicine Institute, if I can put in a little plug, because it's a very close, tight-knit, but also global community. Um, and you'll find, I mean, I have more in common with the people on this call than I do with a lot of people in my organization and people all over the world in the Institute than I do with people I see every day sometimes. Um, so it, it's important to get connected into that network. And that's when you see some, some people to recruit. Um, but the other thing is, and, and it's, it's the reason why we started the workforce development curriculum uh, in LA, because there just isn't that many people that do this. It's a brand new field. People haven't heard of it. You end up hiring the heart and training the brain is, is really how most of it gets done. Um, but 
but uh, there are some things that can be taught. We're always fighting between standardization and customization and all that. And some things can be standardized. And then the rest, you can try and teach how to customize at least. And so people can go back to their own cities and more Train about your brain. It. Yeah, definitely agree with Brett. I mean, I think anyone can do this work, but really those core qualities of um, kindness, love, humility. Um, and then really working on, on the pipeline. Um, we partnered with UCSF and the, their public psychiatry fellowship and have a fellow uh, rotating with us um, every year. Um, it's, it's hard work, but I, I love it. I'm in my dream job. Um, so I think finding folks who have those core components and like Brett was saying, um, through volunteering, um, doing internships, um, you know, working with street medicine teams. And the Street Medicine Institute is a really incredible resource. We reached out and, and connected with them um, in developing our street health teams. And I think anyone, I mean, for sure, one of the best characteristics is someone who can easily talk to people. Um, if you're interviewing someone and they're trying to impress you with their resume, you know, that might not be the best person. But if you're talking to someone who gives you life experience and who even says, well, I, like I said, I worked in the county for a thousand years and I never saw homeless people through the lenses that I had. So when I came into healthcare for the homeless, I had very minimal experience working with homeless, but I can talk to the dead. I can talk to anyone. I can talk to a branch. I can have a conversation <laughs> about anything, yeah. right? And so being able to do that allows me to be able to engage with people. And then I learned everything else through trainings and so forth and so on. I learned everything else. But you cannot learn being able to be open and walking into a place and be respectful of whatever it looks like and even be able to say, well, let me go get a sandwich and we can sit here and talk. You need to, be, if you can do that with anyone, then everything else can be taught. Um, yeah, everything else can be taught. So that's definitely to me one of the best characteristics is someone who could just talk to people. I really like what Brett said. You hire the heart and train the brain. Um, yep. My mom was a, a was a was a, a a juvenile probation officer in Alameda County for thirty six years, and she said always said, "Oh yeah, the people who come back from uh, from um, uh, the Peace Corps are really good," <laughs> and so. Uh, when I did a, a downtown street team, there was, we had a lot of AmeriCorps uh, people who were just coming out for a couple of years and doing it. And those kids, you know, they came from a totally different world. They landed in Berkeley and, I, you know, they're coming from somewhere. And the amount of love and understanding and just daily awe, I saw them in awe. And I thought, well, these kids really are learning and they're learning with us and they're letting us teach them. And uh, I, I thought, yeah, that might be a good pool of people because they're young and they're, it's not just idealistic. They've made a commitment to get out on the street and be with people and they're having a good time. And that, you know, it's like having fun is an underrated medical procedure, you know, and people who have fun, you know, we have fun out, you know, we have fun. You know, sometimes we have to deal with some really heavy stuff, but um, people who find joy and spread and are the cause of joy, those are good people for the live. Thank you so much. I really, I really can't express uh, enough how much this means to the HHRC community, to everybody who's being impacted by your stories and your tips and just like being inspired to do the work that we do. Because it came up a few times, our work is hard, but it's, it's so great. <laughs> like we, you know, getting out and talking with people and um, seeing that success is so wonderful. So I appreciate you being here um, so much. Uh, for our um, attendees, we will take all of the questions that came in, give us a little time, and we'll create an FAQ document to answer. There's a lot of, a lot of great questions that came in. That'll be on our website. Um, Kevin put the link to the evaluation um, in the chat. That'll also come in a follow-up email probably tomorrow from Zoom or just reach out to us um, anytime. We'll get that. Um, we appreciate your time with the evaluation so we can give you a certificate of participation. And also just so that we can, again, gather all this wonderful feedback for our panelists and share that with them um, and as a, us as a team so that we can keep you know, providing these great webinars for you. So again, thank you all for joining us and thank you, thank you to our panel. Um, we appreciate it.
right. Everyone take care. Thank you so much.